Hello, and welcome to Recipes with Ben. In today's video, it took almost a year to make, and it started last August when I foraged plums during the peak of their season. Based on using the iNatural app and the help in the internet, I believe the variety of plum that I have is a Shiro plum, but this recipe would work with any plums you can get your hands on. Now to start, the recipe is based on the amount of fruit that I was able to harvest, so if you want to make it yourself, just adjust based on the amount of fruit that you have. For me, I harvested nine pounds of plums, and the first step in making wine is to process all the fruit. This means I need to deep hit all of the plums, and the best method that I found for these tiny plums is to use a sharp paring knife to cut around the pit, then split it in half and carefully remove the pit with the tip of the knife. I separate the fruit from the pit by placing them in different bowls, and then after an hour-ish of deep hitting all the fruit, I'll place the plums into a mesh bag inside my 3.5 gallon fermenter. Because I'll be removing the fruit later, the best fermenter to use is one with a wide mouth, such as one that has a bucket lid. Next, to bump up the original gravity of the wine, I'm adding some cane sugar at a ratio of one pound of sugar per one and a half pounds of fruit, and the sugar will be added to 2.1 gallons of water that was boiled to sanitize the water. To prevent scorching with the sugar, I turned the heat off and stirred six pounds of cane sugar into the water. And once all the sugar was stirred in and dissolved, the boiling hot liquid was poured over the fruit to help sanitize it. The total volume inside the fermenter this time was around 2.8 gallons. And then I sealed out the fermenter and let it cool down, hoping to reach a temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. After five hours, the temperature had only dropped to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, so I placed the fermenter in a bucket that had water and some ice packs to help speed up the cooling process, but it still did take overnight to drop down in temperature. I think in future, using a wort chiller would help speed up this cooling process to get to 70 degrees faster. Now it's time for some chemical additions to help make the wine. The first is acid blend, which is recommended to use about a half a teaspoon per gallon of wine. For this batch, I'm using one and a half teaspoons for three gallons of wine, and this helps balance out the acidity and make it easier to ferment the wine in the end. Then I'm gonna add in pectin exzyme, which has the same ratio as the acid blend, which is a half a teaspoon per gallon, but for me, one and a half teaspoons of pectin enzyme. This enzyme helps break down the pectin that's in the fruit, which increases the juice yield when pressing it later. Finally, I'm adding in candon tablets that help sterilize the liquid, and it's recommended to use the rate of one tablet per gallon of wine. That means I'm crushing in three tablets and using a spoon to make them into a powder and then adding them into the liquid. The last step in this process is I sanitize my brew spoon by spraying it down with some star sand and then get everything in mix to let the solids dissolve in the liquid. After mixing the chemicals into the juice, I sealed up the bucket fermenter with the four clamps and placed an airlock on top and let that sit aside for 24 hours so the canned tablets could sanitize the juice and be ready for the yeast the next day. And after 24 hours, this is what it all looked like inside my fermenter. It was a yellow, hazy-ish liquid. Now, for the yeast choice for this wine, I chose Lavin Borgavoni RC21. And the reason I chose that is because it says to bring out the jammy fruit flavors in the final wine. The dry yeast recommends rehydrating it first, and according to the package instructions, you want to mix 50 milliliters of water that had been heated up to between 95 to 98, and then mix it with a full packet of yeast. And then sanitize a tiny spoon to stir the yeast into the water solution, and let that sit and hydrate for 10 minutes as is recommended on the back of the package. While the yeast was rehydrating for 10 minutes, I took a sample for original gravity, which gave me 1.101. Now, before adding the yeast, I also want to add some yeast nutrient into the wine, and it's recommended that you add one teaspoon per gallon of wine. So for this batch, I'm gonna add in three teaspoons of that yeast nutrient. And then I poured in all the hydrated yeast and gave it a mix of the sanitized spoon and placed the lid back on top, and finally added the airlock and set that aside to begin primary fermentation. But unfortunately, this is where things got a little bumpy in the beginning. When I came to check back on the next day, there was zero airlock activity. So I took a reading with the hydrometer that I had, and the gravity was the same as when it started. So I began to do some research into how to start up fermentation. One suggestion I saw was to open up the fermenter to air to give the yeast some oxygen, so I tried that first by removing the airlock and placing a secondary mesh bag over it to keep out any bugs that may get in during this time. The next day I opened it back up, took another gravity greeting, and it was the exact same as it started. So I gave the liquid a stir to mix everything up, and then I just put the lid back on top and let it sit for an additional 24 hours. Now it was three days and there was still no fermentation activity. And at this point I had only a few options left. Option one, just let it sit there and see if anything happens. 
Option two was dump it, maybe start over with some new fruit. Or option three was to pitch fresh yeast and see again if anything happens. So I went with option three and I picked up a packet of Lavin K1-V116 as it was the closest they had to the original yeast that I got at the local homebrew store. I repeated the same hydration process and stirred the yeast into the water and it looked happy and healthy after 10 minutes. So to help this yeast, I add another teaspoon of yeast nutrient to the fermenter, pitch the yeast slurry into the juice and seal up the lid on top and close it with an airlock. And then magically four days later, after pitching the second packet of yeast, I had airlock activity for once. So then I just let the wine ferment away for six more days and once activity had slowed, this is when I looked inside the fermenter. I pulled the fruit out of the liquid and placed it onto a sanitized colander to let the liquid drain out. And if you have a way to press down the fruit, go ahead and do that now to get even more wine yield. I took out one of the plums to show you what it looked like. And some of the color had been removed and the flesh inside the plum was mostly gone at this point. And this is what the liquid looked like inside after I removed that fruit bag. It was pink and hazy and a few floaters left it behind in the fermenter. I racked it into a clean glass carboy for a second fermentation and got about 7.5 to 8 liters of wine. After about 24 hours in the secondary fermenter, fermentation started to kick back up and I left it in that glass carboy for nearly a month to finish out its secondary fermentation. During that time, the fermentation slowed after about two weeks and sediment started to form in the bottom of the fermenter. I then cleaned and sanitized a new fermenter and racked the wine into another three gallon carboy. I tried to leave behind as much of the sediment and the other fermenter, which means I may have lost somewhere between a half a liter to a liter of liquid, but this is a necessary evil if you want clear wine in the end. I purged a new carboy by blowing some CO2 from my CO2 tank to minimize any oxygen exposure that happened during transferring it, and then I sealed it up and let it continue to age in my basement. I used the dregs that were left over to get a gravity reading, which was 1.010 at this time. After three months, the wine had cleared up beautifully to this dark, deep red hue, so I figured it was time to bottle and age this wine in the bottle. This meant coming full circle and racking the wine into the original fermenter used to, for the first fermentation and using that as a bottling bucket. I attached a bottling wand to the mini ball valve located at the bottom and began bottling the wine into these 22 ounce beer bottles that I had. The bottling works when a small pin at the bottom presses into the bottom of the bottle and will keep filling until it doesn't touch the bottom anymore. You want to fill the bottles nearly to the top, and when you move the bottling wand, it gives you just the right amount of head space in the bottle. When it was all said and done, I had seven 22 ounce bottles, and I sealed the bottles up with these bottle caps. And then there was some leftover wine that I sampled at this time to see how it was aging and get a final gravity reading. When I tried the wine at this time, it still had a lot of the original plum character and it was quite dry with a strong tannin character, but had mellowed out since I first tried a couple months ago. The final gravity of this wine was 1.002, which makes the final wine 13% alcohol by volume. So after all the struggles that began months ago and letting it sit in the bottle and aging in my basement, let's see how this turned out, shall we? All right, I'm really excited to try this plum wine that I made from some plums that I foraged uh, last summer, like the end of August. Um, I think the plum that I got was a Shiro plum. It was kind of smaller, maybe the size of like a big marble. And the color kind of changed over time. I think originally it was kind of orangish pink. Then it went to like hot pink. And then when it became super clear, and now that I've aged it, it definitely cleared out um, from the beginning and now it's got this almost orange almost peach hue is how I would describe it so going for the aroma I still got the definite like characteristic from that plum it's definitely fruity it's definitely got like a tannin thing going on with it which definitely comes from the plum itself I would say this wine is a little bit on the young side because it's only been in the bottle for like six months but I tried it like three months ago when I transferred it, uh, and it was still pretty sharp, but it has mellowed out nicely. I find that with like plum wine and other wines that I've made before, that there is definitely like a window between like maybe a year, year and a half that's like perfect. And this is just starting to get into its perfect stage. I do think that this is good. I mean, I'm 
I have many more bottles that I'm aging and we'll see how they age over time. I'll probably try it again in the future, maybe like a year from when it was bottled and another six months to see how this batch turns out. And hopefully I'm going to harvest some more plums uh, this summer. But overall, I think this is really good. It's not, there's no off flavor. It's light. It's refreshing. It definitely has the, the characteristic of the plum that I harvested. And still, it's good though. I mean, I definitely would make this again. I would definitely try the same process with um, other fruit. I do think there was some issues in the beginning that I talked about and magically it got to work and magically we have this delicious bottle of wine. If you ever made any other fruit wine, let me know down in the comments or what you're excited maybe to harvest this summer and turn into wine. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe so you don't miss out and I'll see you next one. Cheers.